Hey, hey, people. LTPG here. Ah, Chile. Home of suspiciously influential Croats, astounding infrastructure, LARP, and since the 7th of March this year, also a surprisingly good focus tree in the hit 3K strategy game Hearts of Iron 4. But this isn't a focus tree like any other, for beneath its deceivingly normal looking surface, it hides a secret leader of great renown, who in our timeline only rose to prominence in a later era. So strap in, as I with the power vested in me by non-linear editing software and being a bit retarded, slow in the head to transport you to a world where Augusto José Ramón Pinochet Ugarte conquered the world. Alright, finally back in the saddle again. So, to play as Augusto Pinochet in Vanilla Hoi 4 without dishonoring yourself by turning off Iron Man mode and opening the terminal, you have to do the Satellite Kingdom's focus, conquer Peru and Ecuador, release the Inca Empire for some reason, choose Pinochet as its leader, then annex the Inca Empire again, and then finally release yourself as them. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, yeah, becoming Pinochet isn't that hard, but uh, conquering the world as him is. But Chile's monarchist path is very powerful, so the best way to do a world conquest as Pinochet is to first conquer the world as Chile and then engage in some funny business to conquer your former self, so that's what I'll do. I open with the classic Hoysel's Gambit, pawn of my air force and start verbally berating the lone guy left in the army after my aggressive cuts. And as for our national focus tree, there's really only one option. But a mere two seconds of five speed later I am ambushed by and these posse of in the flesh racists. But luckily, the horrific civil war they're instigating is still several years away, and if my evil schemes go as planned, it will not happen at all. Speaking of evil schemes, my based focus just finished, but this country hasn't had enough based yet, so. <laughs> Damn right. With Ibanez in power, my next step is to instigate a civil war, because it's okay when I do it, and I will use any means necessary. After this high impact violation of our territorial integrity, in a move that future historians will call foreshadowing, I outlaw socialism, which in conjunction with the aforementioned loss of territory, leads to the outbreak of civil war. Almost immediately upon the commencement of hostilities, a mysterious stranger approaches my government. Ooh, let's make him king. Anyway, I have some of my own people to kill, which I'll do by putting all of my eggs in one basket and deploying a single powerful and girthy division with guns in it, a completely foreign concept to our enemies in this war. While waiting for the division to become combat ready, I bait the indigenous population into declaring for me, which both bolsters my army and makes the country slightly less crappy overall. Both my own division and the Mapuche ones have been deployed. We're ready to start advancing. Since Chile is a lanky all country, almost every province we take brings with it a fine encirclement opportunity, which I abuse to make my way all the way down to the far south of the land. And after the fall of the south, the north soon follows. And voila, the west has risen. Now that I'm back at peace and solidly on the wacky frog LARP path, I'll start researching planes and working toward bringing in Carlist exiles, since this will get me a military theorist and an advisor that gives me daily compliance, which will be very important due to our impending aggressive expansion. I also start working on a collaboration government on Brazil, oh that's some deja vu, since they're a very big country that will give me a significant amount of manpower if handled correctly. As the previously unmentioned part of the focus tree that straight up immediately declares war on Argentina draws ever closer, the Carlist intellectuals arrive and are put into government. In other news, some more modern plane models are being researched, and with the help of this ridiculously broken military industrial organization, they'll be some of the best in the world due to their ridiculous range. I'll have to win my first non-civil war without them though be it, as a conflict with Argentina is just around the corner. My plan is to use a few bulky divisions to push to Rawson and two more to clear out the Argies from the Tierra del Fuego, resulting in an encirclement. The rest of the front will be covered by horrifically small and under-equipped divisions, but I'm counting on them holding long enough for my pushing divisions to finish the job. And here's the moment of truth. Vanquishing the RGs in the south is a walk in the park, as I win wherever my good divisions are, but the situation is much more precarious at those parts of the front filled only with what are in effect unarmed conscripts, so I'll have to act quick. I lost Santiago. Man, this might be harder than I thought. Oh well, at least my southern push is going well. I've reached Rawson like planned, and boom, that's an encirclement. Hecking RG cells seething over Chile chads. I continue along the coast and start advancing with my placeholder units, as the Argentine division count has been severely reduced at this point. 30 days until Argentina is finished, but unironically. 
And there they go. Now that Argentina is gone, Uruguay, Paraguay and Bolivia are next on the list. And aside from Paraguay being very disagreeable and just refusing to surrender, like what the freak man, that's not even a victory point. The wars against my neighbors went off pretty hassle free as they preside over a fairly powerful country at this point, partially thanks to the ridiculous compliance I get. But now it's time for a greater challenge, namely Brazil. The plan is to use my now slightly better equipped line holders to <laughs> hold the line against Brazil in the south and use my proper divisions to naval invade Brazil's coastal cities, which in conjunction with my collaboration government on them should be enough to make them capitulate. To sweeten the deal I also designed my first airplanes, and oh boy are they beautiful. Alright, let's see how it goes. And it seems it goes rather well. The Brazilian army is too preoccupied with Chile and Bolivia to defend their heartland, so after some VP rushing, Brazil is mine. Now it's time to take the countries I need to release the Incan Empire, namely Peru and Ecuador. I'll start with Peru, and since they're always a real treat to invade, I will utilize naval invasions to cap them quicker. And as with Brazil, the naval invasions work well. Wonders. Lima falls in mere weeks, and a huge part of the Peruvian army is encircled in the southern Andes. Though I must admit that declaring war on Ecuador before finishing off Peru isn't my brightest moment. Not that it changed the ultimate fate of Peru at all though, or of Ecuador for that matter. But yeah, now I can finally bring Augusto Pinochet into this world. I can't wait to play as him in uh, 9 years. My focus war goals in South America have run out now, but since the war in Europe has kicked off, the world tension level is more than high enough for me to justify manually, which is what I'll do. Since I'm more and more encroaching on the sphere of the United States, I also start doing collaboration governments on them to make them cap more easily when my war with them inevitably comes. Upon invading Colombia I realized that I've grown too big for as they no longer present a challenge for me. I keep justifying on them though, because game is game. In other news, my war goal on Mexico is coming up soon, so I plan some naval invasions along their Caribbean coast. And there we go. The naval invasions go off without a hitch, and gee, this is going so well, I sure hope nothing horrible happens. Are you f kidding me? Okay, they've almost capped and haven't called anyone in yet. I can still avoid war, please don't join, please don't- <clears throat> well, hecking bad luck award to me I guess, but I refuse to let the Angloids and their dogs stop me from conquering the world because my Hyperborean spirit is simply too powerful. I quickly reorganized my reserves to cover my borders with the Allies where Venezuela was killed off screen for pacing reasons and put my Mexican army on the American border because they can join at any moment. And sure enough. As Japan's rape arc begins across the Pacific, the Yanks joined the Allies, and soon after also the late Mexico, in their war with me. Luckily, this is Hoi 4, and the US in Hoi 4 is almost always fairly easy to kill if you invade over land, so despite only having 24 12 width divisions on their border, the front line lights up with so much green that inner city youths would steal it from me. But unfortunately, the Guyana front is less of a walk in the park and more of a slug in the brain. But since I'm not one to back down and I'm in possession of a good air force, I eventually manage to seize all of the ports in the Guyanas thus subjecting a comical amount of allied divisions to unconsensual starvation in the Amazon rainforest. However, while the Guyanan front has turned around, my luck on the American front is running out. It seems the gringos had time to mobilize while I was busy in South America, as they are now severely outgunning my small divisions along the entire front. So much so, in fact, that I'm reduced to lost standing my entire army, but even this is not enough, and the Rio Grande is soon crossed by allied forces. I decide to pull back into Mexico while waiting for my units in South America to finish off the gargantuan encirclement that is the entire Amazon rainforest, and with the help of my cast and favorable terrain I am able to hold on. And with the Amazonian encirclement finished I am able to allocate many more units to the American front and I can finally advance again. And boy do I advance. Mere weeks after the commencement of Fall Yank, Texas falls along with many of her defenders. Although its fall is only a matter of time, America fights valiantly and causes many a headache for me with their unreasonably chunky units that beat me in every single one-on-one -on -one engagement like what the f- they fight so valiantly in fact, that I'm forced to all but drain my manpower supply to train enough units to keep the invasion going. But when the units in question arrive, something snaps, and by August of 43, America falls. And so begins late game, when you have all the resources you could ever need and are only limited by your computer specs. I choose to use my newfound power to annex Pinochet's empire so that I won't have to do it later. And I also start designing some proper ships so that I can cross the Atlantic. And last but not least, I launch the Chilean Sand Shadow program so that I won't have to endure another slogfest like the America War. Oh yeah, I also get some collab governments on the UK to facilitate the imminent destruction. And then all that's left for me to do is to ask my mid-century German competitors for military access 
and send my army over the pond to finish the Allies off for good. On the 20th of August 1944, naval supremacy is achieved and the invasion is launched. After some generous application of the force attack mechanic, Looney Tunes amounts of Brits lay dead on the shores of Sussex, and with the arrival of the by now infamously vicious Chilean Air Force, the Allies are finished. In the ensuing peace deal, I acquire Gibraltar, Sumatra, the British Isles, all of America and Brittany, which I'll use as my launch point for my war with the Axis. Immediately after the peace deal, I start justifying on Vichy France and begin building up Brittany to accommodate my army and air force. And boom, we're back at war. Vichy doesn't stand a chance as always, but because they're cringe LARPers without Vril, the germ cells refuse to follow their ally at the start of the war, so they catch me off guard by joining when I have most of my army committed in Italy. This won't save them though, as I quickly reorganize my troops and start absolutely blitzing through the German line, in huge part thanks to my unrivaled air fleet. With the edge taken off the German army, I move my tank corps to Italy and... And with that distraction out of the way, Italy soon follows. Germany, left wounded and alone, is finished off with haste and uh, caps to the Soviets. But that's fine, I can fix that in the peace deal. I steamroll the last Axis majors and uh, I have no idea what happened in this peace deal, but hey, another faction bites the dust. Alright, now the Soviets and Japan are the only majors left. The Soviets should be a walk in the park considering their hyperwar with the Germans, but the Japanese may turn out to be a tough nut to crack, so I start producing some high capacity rice cookers in anticipation of the war. For the Soviet war I plan some naval invasions into East Germany and a land invasion from Norway. When the war is declared, the naval invasions barely face any resistance and the Soviet resistance in the north can only be described as pitiful. Shockingly, the exhausted Soviets don't do too hot when up against 48 medium tank divisions and a ridiculous sized air force and the Comintern is soon at death's door. After annexing as much territory as I can, I set my sights on Japan. Since I've stolen basically every boat in the world at this point, I have completely free reign to naval invade them. Chilean troops touch down on the home islands on the 15th of December 1946, and my overwhelming superiority in all military matters leaves them no option but capitulation. Ah, perfect, I can't wait to annex everything. I should have let them die first, man. <clears throat> well, I have to kill them anyway, so it doesn't matter if they take a few things. After a lobotomy to call my nerves, I return to my Hoysel cock chair with a plan. Since I'm playing as a non-aligned country, I don't get faster war goals from being at war with majors, so it makes perfect sense to delay my war with China until I've cleaned up all miners that aren't in their faction, and getting collab governments on China in the meantime. And this shouldn't surprise you, but at this point, countries like Saudi Arabia aren't much of a threat to me, so here's a montage of me killing them all. Ah. What a refreshing warm up, but now it's time for the main event. Suffice to say, it goes pretty well, and a mere two months after the declaration of war, the Middle Kingdom kowtows to its natural master. Now only communist China is left. And voila, world conquest achieved. Oh yeah, there's still the tag switch left. So, to make it possible for an all but unarmed country to take down a world spanning empire, I have to be very meticulous in my self sabotage. I start with the obvious, like deleting my army and my division templates, but in the four or so months it will take for me to justify on myself, the Chilean Hyper Empire will have more than enough time to make new templates and divisions to kill me with, so the gimping must go on. I delete all stockpiles, production lines, air wings, ships, army experience and political power. Then I check the compliance map mode to see where I have core states outside of Chile proper. I remove all buildings from all territories of the countries with cores there, namely Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina, release them as puppets to reduce Chile's core victory points, and finally, after 14 years of gameplay, I walk into the unknown and become Helicopter Man. I immediately start training troops and start justifying on Chile and Uruguay. When the war goal has been justified, Chile's division count has grown, but considering their fielded manpower, my hopes are still high. And the last thing I have to say is, I walk toward the terror, and I'm on my own, and I'm not afraid, and I have no regrets. Oh, they released Yugoslavia. And there we go, Pinochet World Conquest, in Vanilla Iron Man. Good night. Hey you, you like the video, subscribe and watch this video.